Works for me. All right, thank you, Rabbi Price, for preparing uh, some Divrei Torah for us as uh, we prepare for Shabbos. Okay, thank you, Ramayel, and thank you, those who are attending, those who are listening later on. Uh, parsha of Nusso, a huge parsha, and we want to look at one aspect of one section, and that is the section of the uh, Birchas Kohanim in our uh, vernacular Duchening, or Nesios Kapayim, the lifting of the palms, as described in uh, the words of Chazal, said in the looking within the Chumash, it's a very short section. Chapter six, it's Perak Vav, starting at Pasuk Chaf Beis. And I'm not going to focus too much on the exact text of the Berachas Kohanim, but really an issue that might be built on one word within Berachas Kohanim. And uh, there's also um, an issue reflected in one word in the Bracha that precedes Berachas Kohanim, as it, with many mitzvahs. Prior to doing the mitzvah, a bracha is done on the mitzvah, and the bracha on Birchas Kohanim is very unusual in that the Kohanim who articulate the bracha declare that they're doing this mitzvah, that they were commanded to do this mitzvah. That's pretty standard. We describe it by Sherkin Shanamas for Sabbat Sivanu, but they describe that they were commanded to do the mitzvah ba'ahava, with love. We don't say uh, that we were commanded to put on talus with love. Uh, like Shabbos candles with love. I mean, we should always, we have a mitzvah to love Hashem. We have a mitzvah to love our fellow Jew, but we don't pull that re reference to that into the bracha on any mitzvah that is between ourselves and Hashem or between ourselves and our fellow Jew, actually typically between ourselves and others. We don't even say a, a bracha. So what is up with that word ba'ava in that bracha? And to uh, a second question uh, would be, the fact, very fact, that the mitzvah is for the Kohen, the Kohanim, to give this bracha to the community. So it's intriguing in the fact that we can have situations in which a 13-year-old, fairly uneducated Kohen, uh, he knows enough to be able to say the, the words. In fact, he may not even know the words by heart. He's being prepped with the words by whoever is leading the davening, is up there saying a bracha, and you could have in the audience a group of senior, advanced Torah sages, and we don't reverse it and say, okay, let's have them give the bracha to the child. Of course, that can be done independently, but the mitzvah is on the Kohen to give the blessing, and, and the focus on it being the Kohen's mitzvah, particularly. And uh, what kind of brought this to mind, uh, to me particularly, was um, there was an article very recently. Um, my mother's husband is a... Uh, Sardi Rosh Hashiva in New York, and his Yeshiva Mikdash Melech for a while hosted a Hasidish Rebbe whose uh, shul, I think, had been a fire. I forget exactly what happened. And this it was a Rebbe, but a Rebbe of, of, of sorts in, in the Flatbush area who moved his Yeshiva, his shul, into their dining room at a great, was really very gracious of the Yeshiva Mikdash Melech. And the description in the article about this was how the Rebbe would try to find as many opportunities as possible to join the Sephardi minion for davening after davening in his own minion. He would, which is probably an earlier minion, he'd walk into the yeshiva's minion in time to hear Berchas Kohanim. Because being a Sephardi yeshiva, the Sephardim do the bracha every day in wherever they are. Ashkenaz custom basically outside of central Israel. We don't give the bracha daily today, only in the holidays. But to take advantage of here, so you had this senior and at one point elderly uh, Hasidic Rebbe, who is an unknown also as quite a Torah sage and scholar. And it could be that in Yeshiva that day, you know, some young high school uh, students or just post high school students are giving the bracha. And that's the case for Steinman, the senior most Torah sages of uh, a decade or so ago. Uh, on his trip to America, it was famous that he, in Israel, he heard Berchas Kahanim every day. So when he was here, he tried to go to a minion where there would be a coin press of Sephardi uh, backgrounds who could give the bracha. And again, why the coin specifically? So our question is the word ba'ava in the bracha that's given before, that, that's utilized before, and why the kohanim specifically? And um, also one peculiar word, which we'll see ties together in, in potentially resolving some of this, when the Kohan were given directive by God to give the bracha, so that would be in Pasuk uh, Chaf Gimel 23, so the Torah describes, speak to Aaron 
and his sons are saying, Kosavarhu es Bene Yisrael. Thus shall you give the bracha to Bene Yisrael. And had the Pasuk ended over there, that would have been a meaningful statement. But the Pasuk continues with two more words, Amor Lahem. Say to them, or saying to them. And the extra Amor Lahem, Rashi has actually several comments on the word Amor Lahem, but one comment in Rashi, Amor Lahem, Mali, this word Amor, say to them, which is in its sense almost a redundant word, is also spelled in its fullest form with the Vav, Amor, the O sound, could have been Mem just with that dot on top, or was imagining that dot on top. If it's written with a Vav, it's written Mali, it's full. And that's a signal that Lo Savarchim Bachipazon Uvehalos. Don't give the bracha in a rush. If the word was written without the extra letter, it's like you know, a quick version of the word. Don't give the bracha in a quick, uh, anyway, uh, rushed way, but rather, give the bracha with kavana and a full heart. Well, every time we do a mitzvah, we're supposed to do it properly, but there's an extra focus in this mitzvah that the bracha has to be done with kavana and leif shalom. You, the kohen, as you are presenting this bracha, have to be doing it with care and, and feeling for those who are giving the bracha to and, 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 and an anticipation and a hope of this becoming true. That is used by some of the Mepharshim to explain that the Kohen is being a direct, giving, given a directive. When he's given the bracha, he has to care about his audience. He has to have that ahava for his audience. He has to be giving the bracha, not simply reciting and not simply even um, you know, articulating the words. He has to really mean the words and be wanting that these brachas come to fruition. That leads to another idea. There's a um, work called Me- Metzach Aron that I've seen. So I don't have that safer. Uh, I'm not, I don't think I've even seen it, but I've seen the safer referenced on issues related to Berchas Kohanim. And he says that with that, we can also understand why it's particularly the Kohen. Because who is it that facing the audience, facing another, which subset of Kla Yisrael, facing the larger remaining set of Kla Yisrael, that would be very motivated to want them to be successful. Well, given that the Kohen as a class, the Kohanim, did not have their own agricultural territory and that they were uh, to be dedicated to the base Mikdash and uh, various other spiritual pursuits, and they lived off the gifts, the 24 gifts that come from us to the Kohen, so as a Kohen, turning to the audience, I'm looking at people that, hey, if their crops don't do well, my truma is going to be pretty small this year. Right? If their flocks don't do well, they're not coming to the base of Mikdash for their offerings. And I'm looking to them, and again, I don't think he means to say that the Kohen is doing this with a greed, but there's a, it's a recognition. Their success is my success. And I am motivated to see that they have a success. So it's interesting. I should want their success because I want them to be successful, but there is a secondary motivation because their success translates to my success and is, as a class. Now, arguably, not today, many Torah sages are also supported by the community, but as a class and as a rule throughout history, there have been many, and even today you have Torah sages who have other business um, you know, sources of income and support so, but as a rule, Kohanim, again, in earlier days, as, as a set, the Kohanim would have been very eager to see the success of the people, uh, providing them, uh, coming back to, to help them as well. There's a, um, another idea that was expressed really in earlier source, in the Chinuch. And the Chinuch, uh, when he explains the mitzvah, he doesn't really phrase this as a question of why the Kohen, as opposed to the, the Torah sage and the scholar, but we can see from the way he describes the mitzvah very clearly his understanding of why the Kohen, because when the Chinuch, uh, in this right. mitzvah number, I, yes. Um, for a question, the, the idea that, the first idea that you offered about um, that the, Ko, the Kohanim are dependent on Klai Yisrael, is that explaining Be'ahava as well, or just the so fact he, that the Kohen- Good point, yeah. So he's not using it to explain Be'ahava, he's using it to explain Kohen versus others, 
And it almost almost sounds contrary to Ba'ava, but I don't think it has to be because there's a sense of a oneness and in a sense that you know we, we're a team and you're not separate from me. And the very fact they see, you know, you can have a family dynamic where I get something from my parent or my child, my sibling, um, but uh, that it can just help reinforce the Ava, the fact that we are constantly giving to each other and providing to each other. So he's not addressing that. And it, although it sounds like it could even be almost contrary, I think it, it can work together. Um, the um, the Chinuch, when explaining the mitzvah, it's number 378 in his count, we're uh, um, you know, significantly into the, toward the 613, but um, Sefer Dvarim has a huge percentage to go. But when he describes this mitzvah, and the Shar Shem mitzvah, the roots of the mitzvah, he describes, Shechafetz Hashem betulu ha-godol, God in his great goodness, graciousness for us, once, levarich amo, to bless his people, us, al yidei al yad hamashorsim, through those um, involved in the service, hachonim tamid beis Hashem, who are regularly living in the, you know, in the beis mikdash, in the proximity of the beis mikdash, so the Kohanim are the people who are regularly in the base of Mikdash, who are regularly in tune to the Avodah, to the service of God. And their souls bound up with fear of God all the time. And through their merit, the bracha can be manifest upon them. And them, them, primarily referring to ultimately to us, and that they, because he was referring to God wanting this to be the merit of his people, and that will provide the blessing. And he goes on to say, well, if Hashem wants us to get blessing, why every day send a coin up there? Why not just have Hashem give us blessing? You know, Hashem, if he wants to dole out his blessing at approximately whatever time it is in the morning, why not do it directly? He describes, as I've written in other places, get bikoach hechsher ma'asenu tachol habracha aleinu. We've got to do something to trigger that bracha, to, to quote unquote, Kaviyako, prep the system. Hashem wants us to do actions on our part that display our desire for the blessing, our readiness for the blessing. Yado Baruchu Psucha Lechol Shoel, his hand is open and ready to be giving when we're ready for it. So we do the activity, and that's our, us, meaning represent the coin as a subset, and our having the coin go provide that bracha. But within his description, he's describing the Kohanim as a group that, as a rule, are uniquely oriented to all things spiritual. They're in that environment, and it's their focus, and the avoda. They've got to be very, uh, develop uh, a sense of uh, real focus on Hashem when, when they're doing the karbanos. And that is how he seems to be explaining the, the idea of um, specifically the Kohen. A, a last point, we deal with the you, you wanting the Kohen to give the bracha and going back to the earlier idea that the Kohen looks at the people and he says that I, uh, I have a, a desire to give you a great bracha because I, I, I recognize that this is something that's very, very important, not only for you, but also for me. It's moving to a very different parsha just for, uh, for uh, two, three minutes. I uh, came across this very recently. The run the Rabbeinu uh, Nisim of the Rishonim and his Drasha Saran in explaining when Yitzchak was going to be giving a bracha that ultimately is meant to be a bracha to Yaakov. And in trying to understand a little bit of why things are happening the way they're happening, the Yitzchak is giving a bracha, uh, specifically wanting to give a bracha to Esav, and then uh, Hashem works it out through Rivka that Yaakov is going to get the bracha. Why didn't it work out simply that at that point, Rivka would tip off Yitzchak to the fact that, you know, I really think you need to know that Yaakov is the righteous one. And there are other ways, similarly, it could have happened rather than Yitzchak still thinking this was Esav. And the Ran is a very interesting um, suggestion that bracha is also, uh, the, the effectiveness of bracha, the quality of the bracha is related to the degree to which there is a desire in the one giving the bracha. That Ava of the Kohen is a critical ingredient. In the Pasuk, Amor Laham, the Pasuk is describing giving the bracha with Kavana and Leif Shalim. And the, the Kohen is motivated because he recognizes the fact that 
there's something in this for me too. So all those things inspire a greater bracha. Yitzchak, because until this moment, he believed Esau was the one who warranted it, for him to give a bracha with full fervor, the best way was for him to be thinking of giving it to Esau. Let's say at that moment, Rivka would have been able to convince him otherwise. Or Hashem would have given a message and re- rerouted, you know, redirected him. Wow, okay, that's pretty deflating. All along I thought it was supposed to be Esau, and now I realize it was Yaakov. Okay, Yaakov, come forth and give you a bracha. But it's going to take a long time for Yitzchak to develop that full fervor that he was able to have if he's, look, this is the one that for years I've been thinking deserves the bracha. I'm going to give that bracha. Hashem wanted it to be that the bracha would be given with that same idea of the kavana and the leif shalem, that ava, that currently Yitzchak had until realizing how things work out and the bracha was really meant for Yaakov. And that's the gam baracha he had at that point. But that the full bracha be with that simcha and, and that full sense of uh, uh, um, interest in being you. So that's why it worked out over there in that context. You know, that a, a side point over there, but these concepts can help shed light. Back there, we should all merit only lots of bracha. As I counted those were at the very beginning, uh, the kolo, uh, it's the kolo's summer break will start midweek next week and go with two, one and a half of it, basically about a week and a half Start a week next week and another week, two week and a half after Tishabab. So the next two Thursday nights, uh, there'll be no class at least by the coal in this venue. Um, and have a pleasant Shabbos and Shabbos following that and Shabbos following that. We should merit being in Eretz Yisrael, hearing the Berachas Kohanim daily soon. Um, Amen. If you don't make it to Eretz Yisrael, you can always go to the uh, Aspartic <laughs> yeah, there we are. Next step. Right. Make flesh metal. All right. Have a great Shabbos. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Rabbi Price, for preparing. And uh, we wish the uh, the Kolo a uh, restful uh, summer uh, first break. <laughs> Whatever Thank you. Call it. Uh, All right. All the best. Bye. Everyone have a wonderful Shabbos. Thank you.